of us. I think they still do. I wouldn't get it. You can download it from their website. It's very outdated at this point. I think they're working on updating it, which I think would be a, a really good thing. Um, but this is also part of Title um, 17, which is our code and regulations for radiography, fluorography, nuclear medicine. So, some, so I'm just pulling out some of the highlights. So in California, you have to be, you have to have a special license to perform fluorography. I will say it now. You need to take that test as soon as you can after you graduate. So after you take your ARRT exam, you need to take that fluorography exam and get it out of the way. You don't learn more as you get further away right. from graduation, just so you know. Um, <coughs> operator exposure uh, to scatters radiation is directly proportional to patient. We've talked about that before. You double the patient exposure, you double the scatter radiation which you need. So in reality, that's probably not the case, but that's the theory behind everything. Okay, so that's why the number one thing in radiography is to reduce patient exposure because then we're protecting ourselves also. Now, oh, oh your eyes are blazing over, I know. Okay, AEC rate, automatic exposure control. This is your photo timing rates. 10 R per minute when the AEC is activated. All new equipment, the AEC is standard. It's only on your older equipment. We used to turn it on and off, and now we can't do that anymore. Maybe they make equipment where you can, but none of the new equipment that I know has that. And five R per minute when off or when the boost mode is used. Okay, now what this means is that the, X, the 402, under no circumstances, will go higher than 10 R when the AEC is activated. And I think that's measured at the table top. It's at the tabletop, okay? So the fluoro tube is underneath the table. It will not exceed, it is calibrated. So no matter how big the patient is, what's going on, um, the expo no matter how much you increase the MA, no matter how much you increase the KV, that it will not exceed 10 R per minute, right? You get a big patient on the table, what hyper, hypersthenic patient? Excuse me, hypersthetic patient on the table, just like you're talking about. So, what are you going to have to do? Increase the MA, increase the KV to be able to, to see. And so, you can only, no matter if you maxed it out, the exposure rate will not be any greater than 10R. That's calibrated when the machine is put in. Okay? And that's pretty much what I'm saying. Um, I, I guess we still have boost, boost mode is when you have that hypersthenic patient on the table and you want to exceed that 10 R per minute, you can go into boost mode for a certain period of time. Okay, but I don't know that, we don't have boost mode on ours. Maybe some of the older equipment has the boost mode. All tubes are calibrated to actually operate five R or less. Typical in the state of California, and we'll learn this next semester. We'll just start with this for now, but next semester we're going to learn there's typical, um, AEC off, AEC on, boost, surgery. <laughs> there's different rates depending on what's going on. Um, so it says all II tubes are calibrated to operate at 5R per minute or less. When the image degrades over time, the service engineer may increase it to 6 or 7. But 10 is the maximum, no matter how high the MA or KV, the machine will not operate higher than calibrated. <coughs> AEC is usually not an option to turn off and on, just as I said, it doesn't matter whether it's off or on, the machine is calibrated to whatever, and it cannot go higher regardless of what you do to the MA and the KV. So, my question to you is, when the AEC is on, what is the maximum amount of exposure at the tabletop? And you're gonna say 10 R per minute. They're saying when the AEC, okay, automatic exposure control. So this means that the mach machine is controlling. If we turn that off, that means it's under manual control, under our control. And California's like, we don't trust you. So we're gonna make the regulation lower. That's how I look at it. That's how I remember which one's which. California doesn't trust us as licensed operators to know what we're doing. So they trust the machine better. So when the machine is, is, controlling the exposure rate, it's higher. 
And so, like I said, typically, like ours was what? Ours was, um, well, we had MA, but we, we will do experiments next semester and we'll find out what our exposure rate is. And it's usually, ours was like right at, okay, a little over five. So that we were like out of compliance. Uh, MA and KV is visibly indicated. So these are monitored once a week. So anytime that you do fluoro, the KV and MA is, should be seen. And you should look at that at least once a week, once a week to make sure it is <coughs> shown. Okay. Target to panel distance, that's from the x-ray tube or the fluoro tube to the tabletop. That's the panel, target to panel distance. Should not be less than 18 and shall not be less than 12. Our fluoro tube is underneath the table. It should be 18 inches from the bottom of the table. Okay. It should be 18. However, it won't be any less than 12 inches. So that's your should and shall on this. California State recommends 18, but no less than 12. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay. Do you see this? This is, a, again, a C-arm. Have you seen your C-arms in your department? Do you know what this is? This is the x-ray tube. But this is, does it look like our x-ray tube? Do you see this kind of cone-shaped device there? I don't know what they call it, an offset or cone, C-arm cone. Guess how much that measures. 12 inches. So if you have that on, see, with the C-arm, right, this moves up and down. You can bring the C-arm this closer to the patient. So the patient's here. So if the patient's laying on the tabletop and you bring this up to it, it won't go any further. It, it won't be less than 12 because you have this spacer on, this 12-inch spacer, okay? You, you can move it to where this goes down. It would be more like that, but this keeps it. So it will bang up underneath the table when it hits. It can be taken off. So when the JCO comes around or the JRC comes around and they see that off, they'll cite you. They'll cite your department. So if that's ever taken off, or when the TJC comes, your administrators will go around and look at all those seating arms and make sure that, that those spacers are back on. So that's what it looks like. So that's the, that's the purpose of those. They know if you have that on, then that can never be less than 12 inches. Okay, source of skin distance should not be less than 15 inches for stationary units and should not be less than 12 inches for mobile. So this is um, kind of the same thing, um, but this is to the skin. But again here, not less than 12 inches, not less than 12. Um, and here is just showing you what happens. Here they have the, this is out of your textbook. Um, the II tube is at the same place, okay? But here the fluoro tube is way down here, and here it is closer. So what happens when you move the um, x-ray tube closer to the patient? What happens to the patient exposure? It goes down. It increases. So, we, so that's why that law is less than 12 is just way too close. They prefer it further away. Regulation. Telefiltration, we've talked about this before, 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. Um, that is minimum, just like it is for x-ray. Our total filtration for x-ray is 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. That's inherent plus added. Inherent, remember that, it was 0.5. Added was two for a total of 2.5. Same thing for fluoroscopy is 2.5. Typically, everybody, typically is more. Typically, is more like three. Okay, but this is minimal. It can be more, just not less. Uh, beam intensity should not exceed 2.2 R for, M, for every MA for every minute. Okay, so what that means, do I have, I don't. Okay, so if I have three MA, Three MA for two minutes. What is um, the intensity? Three 
you just take 3 times 2 times 2.2. And you'll have a question like that on your test, and you have one like that in your homework. You have to remember 2.2. Can't exceed 2.2 for every MA for every minute. So you just multiply. The tabletop cannot attenuate the beam over the equivalence of one millimeter of aluminum. Typically, our tabletops are made of carbon fiber, which is very radiolucent yet strong, and that's what's important. Um, but the tabletop cannot attenuate more than one millimeter of aluminum equivalent. Gonadal shielding, all gonadal shielding, this is the same for x ray, so this is nothing new, 0.5 millimeters um, lead shielding. This is for gonadal shielding. How, what is the, well, we'll get to that in a second. Um, now, the question will be, and you won't ever use this, what is the best type of gonadal shielding for fluoroscopy? And that will be the shake contact shielding. Shake contact. Now, that can only be used for male patients. Okay. The other, other than that, it would be contact for fluoroscopy. And I'll show you what that looks like. Bucky slot covers, the lead drapes, lead gloves, thyroid shields. They're all um, 0.25 millimeters of lead equivalent or more. Okay. For gonadal shielding is the only one that's different. Now, if you have a little, what do you use for gonadal shielding at your hospital? Have you shielded anybody yet? What do you use? Do you use a gonadal shield? Do you have a round gonadal shield? Uh, you know, like a square one? I haven't. And then we do that. It's like cut out. It's like a little cut out piece of lead. Yeah, there's one for the guys that it's like a upside down tube. Yes. Um, yeah, there are, that's, um, that's not considered, it's in a shape, but it's not considered shaped. Um, it's a flat contact yeah, it's shield. Yeah, flat. Flat contact shield. And so sometimes they try to make them small enough and designed to where it would just cover the gonads only and not any other anatomy. So rather than laying like a lead apron across. So when you lay a lead apron across for a hand x-ray, you're, that is really, you're not, unless your lead apron is 0.5 millimeters of, of lead, then that's not a gonadal shield. But do you have to shield for a hand? You should. <laughs> you don't have to, not by law. You only have to shield if the edge of the collimation is within five centimeters of the gonads. So if you're doing a hand x-ray, patient's here, the hand is here, is that five centimeters? You know, five centimeters is about two inches. Okay, so that, you don't have to shield for a chest x-ray, you don't have to shield for a hand x-ray, you, you only have to shield <laughs> when the area of interest is near the, the, the collimation is near the gonads. But that's not what we teach you. We teach you to shield everybody. Um, so when you shield everybody, you're using typically maybe a flat, I don't know if it's 0.5 millimeters, it's probably just a piece of lead, which is probably 0.25. Your lead apron's 0.25, and it's okay because you don't have to shield anyway. So it doesn't, but when you are shielding the gonads specifically because the area of the beam is close by, then you want to use a 0.5. So a lot of times people will use the lead gloves. Do you have lead gloves in your apartment? Because they're double, you know, or, or fold your lead apron, we're not supposed to fold lead aprons, but double your lead aprons, with, you know, and then, then it turns into gonadal shielding. So, um, and we, we saw that before the Bucky slot cover. Here's your shape contact. I, I, we have one, I've seen one, I've never used one. Um, but this would be put in um, a male's underwear so that they could turn, you know, how upper GIs and knees, they turn a lot and stuff like that then that might could be used for that. Uh, personally, I've never used it. I was asked for this. Yeah, I was trying to put the gonadal shield in on the patient, and it just never worked. Yeah, the <laughs> that's, why, that's why a lot of times, and that's a good point, that's a lot of times why we don't shield during fluoroscopy exams. The other time you don't have to shield, the other situation is when it interferes with the exam. So you wouldn't shield if it's gonna cover up curtain anatomy. So if you're doing a, a pelvis, you can't shield. Mm -hmm. um, or when you're doing fluoroscopy, every time they move, you have to shift the um, shield with them. Now, here's my other question. Where are you putting the shield? 
Is it on the tabletop or on the patient? Is it underneath the patient? Are they laying on it? Or is it on top of the patient? The floor. The floor. Well, where's your floor O2? Is it underneath the table? Yeah. Then it, the um, shielding should be on the tabletop underneath the patient. We shield to the primary beam. So if it's on top, we're, we're, shield, we're, we're not shielding to the primary beam. Why, why would they set up a room differently with the two on top as opposed to two on one? That is an, an outstanding question, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. Um, here's a shape, con I mean, I'm sorry, flat contact shield, here's a shape. And so let me see if it's next. Now, hang on, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. I have a picture, that's what I want to show you. Um, absorb dose, we know that one rad is 100 ergs of one gram of absorbing material. So for every rad, 100 ergs. What is an erg? It's a unit of energy. It's a unit of energy. I wish I could take you back to physics um, or intro. Um, okay, so. So here's my question. Now, I don't know that they have this on the test anymore. They did it on the old California test, and it was a trick question, so, and I loved it. Okay, so if you have, okay, so one rad, one rad is equal to 100 ergs over one gram, right? Okay. What is 200 ergs over two grams? One rad. Same thing. Very good. 300 ergs over three grams. Three rad. I mean, uh, one, one rad. rad. One rad. So that's right. You reduce that, it goes to this, correct? Mm -hmm. So this is still one rad. 300 ergs over three grams reduces down to this, which is one rad. Lead aprons, we talked about that. Everyone has to have a lead apron if you're going to be ex exposed to five milliar per hour or more. So anybody in a room would certainly be exposed to that. So um, your lead aprons, again, this is minimum amount. Um, our personnel monitoring devices, um, TLDs and OSLs are the two most common. Uh, OSL is um, the more accurate. This is the a more recent one. <coughs> the sensitivity is as low as one milligram. So when you get an ND, remember you had your look at your reports and you have ND. It means no dose. It's not reading a dose. Your dose is so low, it's less than, I think for, um, I, don't, I can't remember for TLDs or OSLs, but that means it's below the threshold. Okay. So an OSL is a little bit more sensitive, one milligram, and 1% um, accuracy, meaning, <laughs> doesn't mean it's only 1% accurate. That means it's off by 1%. So the accuracy is 99%. Would be a better way to put it. So, um, <laughs> 99 percent accurate, 95 percent accurate. As you know, the dust limit is per year is five grams per year, and um, where's the least amount of scatter to the patient? Our patient is our scatter. That's what we're protecting ourselves from, and so we're to stand in relationship to the patient, and that is 90 degrees, and that for many reasons. The first reason is um, the first reason is that as the X-ray beam hits the patient, the greater the angle from 90 degrees to zero, the greater the angle, the weaker the scatter. So that's 90 degrees. Um, and then, of course, the other reason is because we have the lead drapes coming off the floor of the tower, which is 90 degrees to the patient. Make sure you wear your TLD or your personnel monitoring device outside the lead apron. If you are pregnant, then you will be issued a second badge and it will go underneath the lead apron. So we do have badges that go underneath the lead apron, but they're in addition to. A lot of these secondary devices are in addition to your primary device. Okay, so that is always your primary device and it's always worn in the chest area outside the lead apron. We want to know the maximum amount of exposure you're, you're getting. We know in reality it's less, correct, because of the lead apron. If you wear your um, thyroid shield, she has it there. I caution you just to be careful not to take off. The first thing we do after an exam, 
take off that lead apron, take it off and put it down and, and we're thinking about the patient, remember to take that off and not leave it in the room. I've had students where three days later it's still in the room on a lead apron in the room, you know, and so make sure that doesn't happen. So um, we talked about this TLD uses lithium fluoride. Um, questions that um, your older techs, and I'm one of them, we grew up with film badges and it had literally a piece of film in there. And so if you washed it and dried it, um, if you washed it and dried it, it would um, ruin it. If you left it out in the car with heat, you know, inside a hot car, that would affect it. That would add exposure to it. These new ones, these are using crystals and the heat from the car, leaving it out in the car, leaving it in your glove box. While I don't recommend that, it's not going to cause any more exposure to it. So if you have any of your texts saying, don't leave it out in the car, or you left it in the car, you better go get it. Well, you need it for your department, but that it does not hold true anymore, okay? Um, they're not heat sensitive anymore, like the whole film was. And OSLs use aluminum oxide, so they're just a little bit different. And what happens, what, depending, whatever crystal it is, it doesn't matter. The crystal absorbs the radiation exposure, then we, they use a lead, uh, red laser light to excite it, it emits light, and then they measure the light from that. Okay, more radiation exposure, more light. Here's a picture for the scatter radiation. So here's the x-ray tube, here's your patient. Um, the um, least amount of scatter radiation will be um, 90 degrees to the point source. So where the x-rays enter the patient, 90 degrees from that is the least amount of radiation exposure. Now let me tell you, back scatter, do you think standing over here is the best place to stand? Okay, two reasons why it's not. Um, first of all, um, you look at this radiation coming at, um, I don't know, is that maybe 20 degrees? Um, so standing here, you're gonna get that back scatter. You would think that would be the least amount of exposure you know, hitting the patient and coming back in the same direction as the source, it can retain up to two thirds its original energy. Scatter radiation coming directly back to the source can, doesn't always, but can retain up to two thirds of the original energy. So standing here is not the place to stand. Also the tube leaks. Every x-ray tube leaks, don't forget that. So standing behind the x-ray tube is not the place to stand. That's where I would stand during portables, right? X-rays are not heat seeking, correct? X-rays go towards the patient in the bed and then hit the patient. First, of, uh, chest X-rays, low dose. Is that radiation going to get me way over here behind the X-ray tube? No. No, I didn't have to worry about that, but dummy didn't know that the tube leaked. So here I am standing behind the tube. Does it leak a lot? No, it's regulated, but still. So just remember that the X-ray tubes leak. No, the X-ray tube is not your protection. I'm wearing contacts, I take a thyroid pill, I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, I'm sure the contacts are not because I'm getting older, and I'm sure my thyroid is not because my grandmother and my mother had thyroid problems. Okay, but you never know. Okay, patient holding, only in an emergency, and I can't think of really that many emergencies where you would have to, to hold. Um, certainly not routinely. Students are not allowed to hold. You are not allowed to hold. You're the one to make the exposure. And then um, always um, shielding is provided. So we that's why we have positioning sponges and devices and straps and all kinds of pigastats for that reason. So don't get in the habit. Let me tell you, and that's me, that's me too, it's easier for me to go hold a patient than it is for me to find the sponge, get the tape out, do all of that. I could have had three other patients done, right? So don't get to be that way. You know, use your positioning devices. Take that extra 10 seconds to use it. So again, um, be aware of that. Okay, ISO, ISO exposure, exposure profile. This is um, in your textbook. So look at without the lead apron. And I'm talking about the lead drape right here. Here, now, Again, where do they get these numbers on? You know, here it's at one foot away, it's 500 milliard per hour. I don't know what MA they're using, what KB, what kind of tube, I don't know any of that, but it's 500 milliard per hour at one foot away. Look what the lead drape does, five milliard per hour. So, and we knew that. 
we, we did the Geiger counter last week, didn't we? We knew it, it stopped it pretty well. So I want you to know the ISO exposure profile. At one foot is 500, at two feet it's 100, and at three feet it's 50. I did the inverse square law on this, and it's like 125, and this is 45. It's so I think close. they just rounded up. Why didn't they keep with the true inverse square law? I don't know. I don't know. But so you think if you only knew one, you could figure out like two and three, right? One fourth, one ninth. But it doesn't work out that way. So we have the lead drape. Now, here, Mr. James, is your over and under. So here is the um, under the classic, what I call classic or conventional um, design where the x-ray tube is underneath the table. And look at the scatter radiation coming from here. The uh, radiologist has his lead apron on, or in this case, his lead apron on. And what else do you have down here? The tube is covered by the parts of the table coming down. So that absorbs some of the scatter. Then it was a design where the x-ray tube or the fluoro tube is on top. Look at the exposure to the patient, to the operator, excuse me, to the operator with this. Okay, so why did they do this? I really don't know, but because of this exposure, guess where the operator sits? And I say sits. They're outside the room. Are these... Do you have the, the rooms where you have the glass windows and the radiologist sits behind the control panel outside of the room? That's that design. That's why they're not in there. And I don't know why they designed it like that. Maybe so the operator could be out of the room. And this maybe it's easier to manipulate with the controls with the, in this situation. The other thing about this, the, the, what I'm guessing is that the overhead x-ray tube can be the fluoro tube and the x-ray tube. We only have one tube in the room as opposed to when there's a tube under here, you have to have your overhead tube for your other exams. So only one tube, but then there's so much exposure to the operator, they're outside the room. So who's inside the room? So that's why when, you need to think about this, when you go into, and I call them, and I think they are called the remote rooms, the radiologist is operating the controls from outside the room, not at the fluoro tower like we would in our room. And so they um, send you in there to give the patient some barium, turn the patient, help the patient. So what, so what are you going to do? You, you know now we were in the room last week. So what are you going to do? Stand 90 degrees away. Okay, so we're, is there a lead apron mm -hmm. on this? I don't think so. Is there a lead apron hanging on oh, that no. thing? Not like, not like here, right? Remember? So I don't think there's a lead apron. So, so you Stand first as far, of all, as far away. Okay, yeah. as far as away. So you're standing at the door. Okay, the doctor needs you to give the patient some barium, right? I, I'm. Yeah. Yeah. So you go in there and you give the patient some barium. You put the straw in their mouth. Make sure they have it. Put it in their mouth. Then you back up with your leg. And mm -hmm. towards the door. Don't turn around. Let me ask you this: Does the radiologist turn off the fluoro when you walk in there to give the patient that barium, or turn turn them, or whatever? I hope so. <laughs> well, you need to find out. You know, you should hear an audible sound when fluoro is on, just like you did in our room. There's a constant be a sound, a beeping of some sort. So you should know, and you can ask the radiologist to not fluoro while you're in the room. A good radiologist will respect your exposure and not fluoro while you're in the room. Now, a lot of times, as soon as you get that patient to bury them and you start walking away, then they, <laughs> then they may start. So don't turn your back, depending on the apron you have, is open in the back. So you'll see the text walking backwards. Or if you don't want to walk all the way back to the door, put that lead portable lead shielding and work from there. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly okay. So you have your lead shielding on, you have the, the the door looking thing on wheels, mm -hmm. the lead shielding, do something with the patient, and then go back to that. It has a window or you can look around it, you know, just any barrier between you and the patient scattering. Yes. I also noticed that they have like the see through plexiglass, so it's like this, just like this wall. That's, mm -hmm. like That's what you're talking about, right? They the stand behind too. Yeah, yeah, it's leaded. It has lead in there, yeah. 
It's a shield. It's a barrier. Mm -hmm. So as long as it kind of like reaches around, can sort of cover. Perfect. If you can see through that thing, the ones I'm used to are all metal with a window in it. So oh, the yeah, fact that they're all glass clear. or whatever mm -hmm. is wonderful. And so the you know, and I always feel like the patient, a poor patient, they're in there with this gown. We had this lead apron. We're standing behind a barrier. The radiologist is out there. Okay, turn over. You know, <laughs> and it's like. Okay, you know, it's kind of intimidating. So I think your very is your job as a radiographer is very important for patient care procedures when the radiologist is out there and, and we're standing behind stuff. So you really need to bring, you know, out that good patient care part of you when a patient feels very vulnerable like that. So um, so yeah, so over versus under. So pay attention to that. Here again, this is out of the California syllabus. Um, and what is this thing? So here you have the x-ray tube underneath the table, 8 millirad. Here it is above the table, 27 millirad. So like three times, almost three times as much. Now, both can be low. I'm not, both are low exposures, but one is more than the other, and that's because of the design, and that's why the radiologist is out of the room. So when you're working in those rooms, it doesn't mean you can't work in there, just pay more attention to what you're doing. You don't have a radiologist to stand behind, right? So um, this is pretty much our table, our classic design of what we have. And here's one where it's underneath the table and the x-ray tube is above. 